Hey, Josh, Josh, when you're talking, if I want to move that, and because you got to get around on this computer. Okay. Fifty one people in the waiting room trying to find Steve and Martin so I can let them in. You so I can let them in first. Or Steve. Are you in communication with Martin? I don't see his name. He's probably listed as iPhone or some other. Coming in faster than I can admit people. Hi, David. Hey. I'm good. There you are. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, gentlemen. Hey, Steve. How's it going? Good. I think Mark and I are going on board. Everyone's about to move the mic. I got him. That's me. That's me. It's coming back through you. I'll mute you. That should have stopped it. Josh, you okay with covering things tonight? This is yes. Okay. All right. Well, great. I appreciate that. I just figured it'd be easier to see who wants to say what and things like that. And I flag Mark if I need to say something, but uh, I thought I just bring it, call it to order, do the announcements, and um, then indicate to the group that because of the nature of the business tonight, that I'm going to ask the vice chair to assume the uh, duties of uh, running the uh, running the meeting, uh, since it'll be easier for him to see what's happening than me from here. So I think that take care of it, Mark. Uh, seems to think there'd be no issues about that. I vacate the throne. 
I'm gonna I'm gonna mute me until I need Mark, you just tell me when it's good to start. When it's time to start, I'll go ahead and uh, get the meeting started, okay? Yes, sir. Are you on your phone or are you on the computer? Turn your sound down. Turn your sound completely off. I'm on an iPad if that makes that a difference. It? Yeah. Only one I didn't find was Marvin, so somebody could text him or something and tell him to identify himself, I'll turn him on. I'll let Sabrina in. Martin indicated they've got a busy night at the hospital, so he didn't know how long he could stay in, but he wanted to at least be in there, you know, for much as he could, is what he told me. He called me this afternoon. He says our ICU beds are full, and they've got 47 people on ventilators at um, Jackson Madison County General. Try to brave move. I'm gonna turn them all on and see what happens. I'm gonna turn them all on and see what happens. No, all the people. She said, "Mid all." Hmm. 82 right now. Say again. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, it's uh, five o'clock. You have a quorum. The meeting is yours. You'll have to. Unmute. All right. Thank you, sir. I'm pretty. Yeah. I'm sorry. I was in the middle of trying to negotiate this. Uh, this system. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for the weekly County Board of Education meeting this uh, July the 20th. Thank you for joining us in this important uh, meeting. If you all will please stand and join me in the Pledge of the Flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America. and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, one nation under God, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for uh, being here this evening. I want to make the announcement that our next uh, Board of Education meeting will be held in person and virtually on Thursday, August the 6th at 5 o'clock uh, here in this uh, 
Wicked County Conference area or on Zoom. Um, at this time, because of the nature of the meeting, the business of the meeting tonight, and the fact that I'm, everybody's there, but basically me and, and Martin, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Vice Chairman Josh Moore to handle the meeting tonight, because he may be in a better position there to um, handle the meeting, know who's uh, making uh, what comments, who needs to be recognized and things of that nature. So. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn the meeting over to uh, Vice Chairman uh, Josh Moore and ask him to carry on for the evening. And I'll just be a, another school member on the sideline tonight, uh, uh, just uh, one, of, one of the normal people, as they say. Thank you, Josh. All right, thanks, Steve. We'll go ahead with the uh, agenda and proceed with the meeting. At this time, we will uh, look at the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? All right, is there a second? Second. All right, any questions, concerns related to the agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Uh, all opposed say nay. And the agenda as presented is approved. We'll move on to the approval of the minutes of the June 4th and the June 16th school board meetings. You'll see those in your packets. Is there a motion to approve these minutes? So moved. Okay, moved. Is there a second? All right. Any questions, concerns related to the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes say aye. aye. Uh, all opposed say nay. And the minutes are approved. At this time, we will consider and approve the revision of school board policy. 6.310 this is the second reading of the dress code and uh, the last time we read this last month and so at the approval of this reading this would go into effect is that correct okay is there a motion to approve this revision is there a second all right any questions comments Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the revision of this school board policy say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. And the school board policy revision is approved. We'll move on to consider and approve adding school board policy 6.414. That is the student suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention. <coughs> this is the second reading, so at the approval of this policy reading, it will go into effect. Is there a motion to approve? Is there a second? Second. All right, any questions, discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of this reading say aye. Aye. All opposed, and the motion is carried. All right, at this time we'll move on to agenda item number five, which is to consider and approve hiring volunteer coaches, which you have in your attached uh, packets. And uh, we will go ahead with the motion to approve these volunteer coaches. Move to approve. All right, is there a second? Are there any questions, concerns, discussion related to these volunteer coaches? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. And the volunteer coaches are approved. Okay, at this time we will consider and approve the revised budget for academic year 2021, and the revisions are attached. Is there a motion to approve these revisions? Motion to approve, please. Anyway, okay. Is there a second? Second. All right. Uh, Director Frazier, can you give yeah. us some information? What we've included, as I shared with you all via email, in our county commission presentation for the budget, the commission approved to take over our debt service funding of four hundred twenty-four thousand seven hundred eighty dollars. We've been paying the debt service in order for us to put that in the teacher salaries. I did a presentation to the commission about our salaries and showed them where we rank last in the area of the ten local districts, and we're about four thousand dollars behind. And so they've approved us to use those monies moving forward for salaries. So I've adjusted all the salaries, all the teacher salaries in here, which you'll see across the board, a minimum of $2,000.
raise on those salary lines. So that gets us competitive. We move from 10th uh, to at least eight in ranking. In a couple places, we moved up to fifth. So it's it's better. It's a start. And hopefully, in the future, we'll be able to move forward. So that's that's where we stand with having these proposed changes that deal with salaries and benefits. For non-certified personnel, and speaking with the commission, I think there are no raises for those uh, folks, but the intentions are when all revenue is collected to pursue a bonus in the fall for those teachers. We've done that a couple times in my tenure. And so we'll, we'll be having those discussions in the upcoming months about bonuses for everyone else. All right, with the Revised budget having the motion and the second. Are there any other discussion, questions, concerns? Really appreciate all the hard work that's been into this. I know Mr. Frazier, several, in addition to just big thanks. Very thankful. Yes. So, all right, at this time we'll move on to the vote. All those in favor of revising the budget for the upcoming academic year say aye. Uh, all those opposed? Motion carries. All right, so here we go. We coming up on the discussion, the consideration, and approval of the Wheatland County Schools reopening plan for academic year 2020-2021. Is there a motion to approve the reopening plan? I'd like to kind of hear. Well, we gotta we gotta have the motion first. Approval here. We don't, I'd like to hear okay. before we right. approve it. I'll go ahead. Okay. Let's go ahead and do it then. Okay. All right. Sounds good, yeah. All right. Uh, as you all see, I, I emailed you a copy of our completed plan over the weekend for you to look at. I hope you've had a chance to read through that and talk a little bit about, you know, when um, when we closed back in March, we started looking at plans of what this current year would look like and getting some guidelines and expectations from the state. In May, we, we developed a committee of about 50 persons. We divided the work into six different groups. Uh, those persons on the committee to help this reopening plan were teachers, uh, other school staff, parents, community members. Uh, we also got input from our medical, local medical leaders in the community. So they kind of all had input as we moved forward. Uh, I know there was a lot of angst about the delay in putting plans out there. That was uh, we tried to be as thoughtful because what we have seen in, in the last six weeks, the things have changed very rapidly. <clears throat> a couple of systems have put plans out a month ago and now they've already changed their plans. So we tried to, to wait as late as we could and still be as conscientious about getting the information out to the public moving forward. I will say that as you see in the documents, this was this is hard work. And there's nothing about this plan that any of us like. We, we would all like to go back to some kind of a normalcy in our communities, but we all know that the times are different. So as you'll see in the reopening guidance, things will look different when we return back to school. Um, that's just the norm and expectations of what that has to be. I'll also say that the decisions we make tonight are gonna to be wrong either way. Um, because as I get input from the community, we have folks on both sides of the spectrum thinking that we should not open back up schools, until all this passes by, the sun said we need to open up tomorrow and get back immediately. So whatever decision we make is not going to be accepted totally by everyone. I just think we need to look at what's best for uh, the, uh, the safety of our students and our staff, most important, and the health of our community and our area, both economically, uh, physically, and emotionally. So that's why you'll see some of the guidelines while we put as much conversation into this. Uh, you all. As we move forward, I, what I plan to do is I'm going to start with page uh, two. I'm going to kind of skip through the introduction. Now we use a lot of guidance from we use guidance from the State Department, we use guidance from the CDC, the Nurse American Nurse Association, the American Pediatric Association. You can see all those different groups that we listed in there that we use their guidance and try to come up with a plan that we thought fit our our needs. The first committee and the first part of the, the plan that you'll see is what we call operations and safety and health. Operations involve what will the day-to-day -day look like when we return to school. And you can see there that we, uh, we've we also included some terminology of what social distancing means, what, what actually is close contact, 
isolation, quarantine, face coverings or masks, what they mean. We got those those definitions off of CDC. So it's just information. Then we get into what the start of the school day will, will look like. In the first part, we talked about traffic, that we will have multiple entry points into our schools, which will be different. We tried to divide up according to our population where all our children are not coming through the same doors. And so that will look different at each school. We get closer to school, each principal will get out that information that particularly fits their students and their parents at each school building. And that looks different according to the size of school, the age of students. So we do have a traffic plan uh, of what that will look like. Then entering the building, this will be consistent all throughout, throughout our school buildings. When we come into our buildings, we'll have stations set up. We will be doing temperature screens of all students each day when they come into the building. Uh, prior to that, all of our staff will have arrived before that. We'll screen and log temperatures of our staff. Um, we have hand sanitizing stations that will be lined up at each of our locations where students are entering each morning. We will expect for our students and staff to utilize those hand sanitizing machines. As you can see, uh, face coverings are expected all throughout the document. Remember, social distancing is not uh, a and not allowable, we'll talk about that as, as we move forward. So typically in the morning when we begin school, things like transitioning classes, uh, any type of large group, we can't maintain that social distance. We'll be expecting students and staff to wear masks unless they have underlying health conditions. Uh, and we'll accommodate those persons on a case-by-case basis. So that's our building entry in the morning. Uh, on page three, you'll see we've included <coughs> what breakfast will look like. Uh, we'll have multiple options for breakfast in each school. It will vary. Uh, we'll have some students that uh, will be eating in classrooms. And some schools will be able to access and use parts of their cafeteria as we move forward. So um, that will be uh, particular to each school and, and principals, cafeteria managers will be working and, and training their staff and teachers what that looks like in their building. In all of our classes, we've gone into our classrooms that principals have with some of these team members have looked at our class settings and we've tried as best as possible to figure out a way to by following American Pediatric Guidelines to social distance our desk uh, because our county looks so different in some classes it's not a problem at all because our numbers are very small and, and moving desks and, and tables around for seating to accommodate that is not an issue and some of our other classes particularly our high school middle school and class size number is larger than we can do six feet of social distancing. Then we're looking at um, shields for our teachers. We're looking at mask wearing for students and teachers, um, depending on the number of students that are in those classrooms. And that will be something once we know how many students are back, we'll, uh, we'll determine those in particular. And one thing that's very important in meeting with our health department, having conversations, you'll see the second bullet under class seating, the class setting is seating charge. Uh, we're in just about every setting that we have this year, we're gonna have assigned seating charge on our buses and our classrooms in any setting. And we've been asked to do that at the state level because if we do have someone who tests positive and we have to contact trace, we can identify exactly where people were sitting around someone who may have uh, tested positive for the, for the virus. So that's why uh, teachers and staff persons will be assigning seats on buses We'll have assigned seats moving forward. We also have protocol uh, about what happens if uh, a staff or student tests positive, very detailed how we will handle that. Uh, we have uh, some further information we get in the safety of what we'll be looking uh, to do. We will be uh, monitoring what's going on in each classroom, be plenty of uh, PPE, hand sanitizing equipment in each classroom. We'll have disinfectant wipes so we can wipe down our desk and things. We have gloves for students and staff to wear, disposable gloves. Uh, they're wiping down equipment and once they have things wiped down, they can dispose of those. So that's our class setting. It looks different according to age group to move forward. Yes, sir. Bring up the PPE equipment when it comes to the hand sanitizers and the sanitizing stations. I see. Number one, we have it all here. And number two, what kind of monthly supply? Are we, are we looking at? Do we have enough to? We don't at this point, and, and what, what's happened, and, and you'll hear me say this throughout the issue, we have 
ordered uh, I believe 200 hand sanitizing stations for our buildings that we plan on mounting and having them there with, with plenty of materials. And with this recent surge in the last three weeks, everybody's ordering those materials. So uh, we do not have them at this point. We've been told that within the next two weeks they'll be delivered. But at this point, they're not up. And that's something as we move to the end, I'll address with the board concerns about things that we feel like, like we may not have. Um, that six weeks ago, we didn't feel like it was going to be an issue. We're going through this just to keep it. Here's our plan when we return to school. Well, what I'm saying, through, through the course of you going over this, would you like us to be there in question? Absolutely. To the very end or to stop? No, we'll stop where we're at. Yeah, it's too much to cover. So, any, any kind of question that you have, we'll make sure you stop. Stop in education. I feel the need to. And also, I think I can answer most all the questions in here, but. I do have the chairpersons of each committee available. Or if there's a question I can't answer, we can ask them to chime in and give some more input. Uh, you'll see the guidelines for staff workrooms and lounges. We're going to limit those. A number of persons can be there uh, at the same time. Class changing, there's specific guidelines for that. We're going to limit our, our transition to the building as much as possible. That's easily done at the lower grade level, other than maybe going to recess um, for some of their specials. They remain in their classroom throughout the day. It's a little more difficult, particularly in high school and middle school. So when you transition classes, there'll be markings uh, throughout the, the building in the hallways, on the floor, the walls, that will uh, recognize the direction in which we go and the expectations for transitioning classes. Uh, we expect students and staff to be wearing masks during transition periods uh, because we will, we will distance students apart, but we'll have a lot of traffic and sometimes through our building, especially our high school. Locker usage this year, we have had several discussions about using lockers. In general, we'll not be using student lockers this year. Um, in polling a lot of our principals, we have several of our students that don't use them anyway. They, they take their books from one class to the next. Uh, this year, we're gonna try to limit it. We think with our technology that's being ordered, a lot of those books are gonna be online and we're gonna uh, we're going to allow students to use a locker if they want to, but many of them have stopped using lockers, and so we'll be, um, in general, not using them, or we'll be on a very limited basis in using lockers. So that's to cut down on some of our transition. Do, do we, sorry, do we allow um, roll backpacks? We, we allow backpacks, and we talked about this year that we will allow, we're going to be considered for rolling backpacks. Because we think the spreading our students out, we don't have to worry so much about trips and balls. We think our students can handle that. So if they've got something on wheels, we're going to we're going to allow that this year. And we think okay. we can make that happen. Restrooms and hydrations during the day. You know, we're we're required to shut down all water fountains. You cannot mass use water fountains. But we have the no touch hydration stations will be available throughout the school. We'll also be providing. Uh, water bottles, students be allowed to bring their own water to school and keep that on their person. We will be scheduling restroom breaks. We will we'll not have mass restroom breaks during class trans uh, transition. We'll schedule that throughout the day. And we will limit the number of students. Sure. Can't hurt we'll be supervised of how many are coming in and out of the restrooms at one time. We'll help monitor some of those hygiene practices there. Uh, you also can see in many places it talks about the face coverings. And we will provide those for students who don't have them. Uh, we have plenty of those ordered and sent to us from the governor's office in some situations. Lunch is very similar to what you saw at breakfast. Uh, we are in currently looking at um, building some shields in our cafeterias, some acrylic shields that will split, divide the tables in half, which will allow students to step on each side of the table, still adhering to our social distancing. We think we can, uh, we've got a couple of uh, guys, one of them is a local guy, and one is someone in our school that feel like they can build some shields. You'll see if you go in some of the banks and office areas, they've got those. So we're looking at potentially if that works, we may have more children in, actually in the cafeteria eating. That would be a good thing because uh, without that, we're gonna have to have staff and teachers staying in classrooms and, and monitoring kids. And, you know, as we currently said, teachers have duty-free lunch by law. 
unless the governor or someone changes that law, so we'll have to make accommodations. So uh, we have prepared meals, grab and go lunches will be available. We've got even both hot and cold meals will be available whether we're in, in the cafeteria and throughout the building. I just want to say kudos to Ms. Snyder and all of the cafeteria staff. 400,000 meals we've served since school's been out. And uh, we're looking forward to continuing that in, uh, throughout this school year, the 2021 school year. And then uh, recess physical activities, we'll, we'll still be having a recess and activities. We'll be mindful of not having multiple classes out there. We'll limit the number of students in play areas. One time we'll also be uh, wiping down equipment that's used by more than one student or putting some of that equipment up and not having them available for allowing students to get out and have some activity and play and do those normal kinds of things. And in the very end of operations is the end of the day, traffic will be um, particular by each school. They'll have students going out multiple doors where we're not all uh, trying to exit the same way. And we'll ask students to wear a mask as they're leaving the building because we'll be transitioning um, several students out at one time. <clears throat> so that's our operation plan. And I will say as we go through this, this is fluid. You know, it, as we get through this plan, there are going to be things that work great. We'll keep moving forward. There'll be things we need to alter and change, and we'll do that as needed. Plus, I'm sure there'll be other guidelines and expectations from the state or health officials that may also change or alter what we do. So, but that's our operations plan. Do you want to have a question on what the day to day operation looks like? We have shields, masks, and shields for our teachers that we've ordered those clear shields that you may have seen on television a little, a little bit wider. <coughs> Well, when will that come in? We have some of that. We have uh, oh, yeah, right. just about all of our masks and uh, face shields are in enough for us to. So the face shields are wearable face they shields. They are. It's kind of like got a band across the top and go down in front, not right on top of your face. Is there been any, or what about, we call them speech shields? Like the sneeze guards, like we see it in banks and, and just Walmart and places like that. Those are an option for yeah. our teachers. Um, they are, of course, the problem is everybody's ordering those at the same time. You know, we've had, uh, we've had at least one shield that we've ordered that's come in that we've taken out as a student shield. And as it sits on a student desk, about three feet high, and I'd say maybe two and a half feet wide, that a student could have on their desk would be their personal one, and if they change classes, they can take their own shield with them. We're also looking at having some developed and made for teachers podiums. Uh, those kinds of things we've got a local vendor so we hope to have some of those uh, in place on top of the facial coverings that we wear i, I just 91 percent of the debts in the state of tennessee being age 50 or above i know we had our discussions that's roughly 30 percent of our right. property uh, i would I, I know we are but i hope we may i hope that we can get those sneeze guards for our teachers because i Thing that bothers me the most personally, we get two teachers sick at all ten buildings. We're screwed. You know, we don't we don't have the you know, substitute situation is difficult. It's Absolutely, easy. substitute staff will be an issue. We want a sneeze shield. What is that? See it Walmart and uh, just a piece of there's a plexiglass that sits right on the top of it. So they will tell you keep it on the desk. Don't pull this. What what documentation do you have to have? We have to, we don't accept that. You got to you got to tell them. We're conducting business. We're just conducting business with the, the board right now. If you have a question, we we can we might open it up at the end. Okay, if you don't mind. Okay. okay. Any other questions about operations? All right, if you'll turn with me to page five, this is the safety and health. And I want to thank our local health department who have been great to work with and kind of help walk us through some of these protocols and what we need to do. Uh, you can see we start with mental health supports. Uh, as we begin transition back into school, we'll be providing uh, both our staff and students opportunity to debrief and talk about the impact of what we've all been through. Uh, we have Employee assistance, uh, mental health supports available there. We have student assisted mental health, which we have every year. 
that will provide for any student that may be, uh, we recognize as having some issues as we close down. Uh, we also have our, our safe schools and our tech tip that we'll be implementing as normal. We feel like it may be an increase with some concerns there and we'll address those as we move forward. The second part is the cleaning, the daily cleaning of the building. We'll be adding cleaning staff in, in our school buildings. We'll be adding an extra day person full time, a part time person at night that their total job will be to help disinfect in addition to the general cleaning that's there. Uh, that's an additional cost that we'll be using some of our CARES Act money and the Stafford Act money to help with that. Uh, so we, you know, we look forward to having those buildings are really clean. We disinfected them with the uh, spraying units uh, as soon as schools close down and we'll periodically do that throughout the school year as, as needed. Emergency drills like building evacuations for fire, tornado, those things, we'll do those and we'll keep mindful of our shelter in place procedures. We'll always trump social distancing. We have an issue where we had to do so and so we just recognize that in our plan. Uh, visitors and vendors will be limiting visitors on campus. Um, all of our vendors and visitors will be screened at the door and will be required to wear masks to get there uh, in our building and, and need to be in our building. Today. Rental health, we know we're going to be seeking throughout the year looking for parent volunteers that are willing to maybe come and help uh, screen and take temperatures to become part of our volunteer team. We would screen them just like our staff and maybe help out with some of our monitoring of cafeteria if we have to alter our places for, for meals. We're looking forward to doing that and also recruiting folks that may one day be interested in helping substitute teachers. On page six, this is a detailed description of the daily temperature screening and what, will, what happens if a student comes in and we screen them and they have elevated temperature. We will have a specific room different than the nurse's station, which we will call a triage room where if the student has symptoms, that we'll uh, triage that person in their room. The nurse will uh, specifically monitor them and we'll contact the parent, ask them to pick them up with the staff. In the morning comes with temperature, we'll immediately I'll be looking for stuff for them and we'll ask them to return home. Uh, one of the things that will be an issue this year that will be very important in the past, in a normal year, we have trouble getting in touch with parents during the school day. Sometimes parents' numbers will change. We don't get the correct information during registration. This year it will be important that if we have a child that is feeling ill that we get in touch with emergency contact. So uh, we're going to give Parents notice that we need correct information. The Department of Children's Services said they will help us if we're unable to get in touch with, with parents if we have someone that uh, needs to be picked up at our school. And you can see the specifics of what we're looking at as far as temperature and um, how we'll proceed with checking those. We do have those handheld thermometers that you saw coming in here. Uh, we got ordered one for every teacher in our system, so they'll not only have them at our building opens, we'll have them in our classrooms. We're going to monitor. Or if a child starts feeling ill in the classroom, a teacher can check their temp. Um, nurse will be able to we'll call the nurse will come to the classroom and get that student and then we'll uh, remove them to our holding area and check them out more specifically that. And most of these particular guidelines you see on safety came directly from the guidance from the, the health department of CDC. On page seven is the conclusion of the safety part. And you can see, I'm trying to give you the uh, explanation of a uh, contact person who's actually been in direct contact with someone who's tested positive, what the isolation quarantine situations are for, for both patients and anyone coming in close contact and what that looks like. And I will say one thing that uh, we've learned the last couple weeks it's a little different to, um, the only people that have to quarantine or isolate or someone is actually if you've been in contact with someone who has tested positive so if you've been in contact with someone who's a contact of someone who tests positive you don't have to quarantine or isolate so you either have to test it positive or been in direct contact with someone a uh, medical guideline is 10 minutes within six feet is considered close contact and so we've got the stipulations here. Uh, one of the situations that you will see that was kind of unusual, you could live in a house and not ever get infected 
and have to stay quarantined longer than the patients do. If you, if you have siblings or parents that get, get infected, but we don't, we don't control that. That's specifically the health department. Uh, one of the things that will happen if there is a positive case in uh, our buildings, uh, we'll be notified by the health department. Uh, all the positive tells, test information goes to the health department. They'll call us and tell us if someone, either a student or staff has tested positive. And at that point, the health department will look at contact tracing 48, pri 48 hours prior to when that person was tested. So for example, if we were to have a student who became positive, then they would look at maybe who sat around those children for two days. Prior to that, they would contact those families and let them know that they've been in contact and ask them to quarantine at home. Uh, we don't control that. That's controlled totally by the health department. We'll just assist with that. Is there anything in the operation plan, Jeff or Lorna? That I missed uh, several minutes. I got kicked out. Okay. So I, I mean, I don't. I, I think we're we're moving. Everything, everything I heard was was okay. I mean, it sounded like it was on track. Okay. And then you can see we'll look. Uh, we'll just have to determine what's what the situation is. Um, if need be, if we need to close classrooms down, we'll obviously we'll do deep cleaning wherever we need to, and, and we'll just be fluid if we have to shut down parts of the building, um, particular classes, and or the full building. We'll do that under the guidance of the health department moving forward. So that's the, the safety part of the plan. Any board have questions on that? That's it. All right, the next section on page eight is that what will academics look like during the school year? And what you'll see here is there are basically three scenarios that we have academically for the school year. Uh, scenario one is traditional school where teachers teach and students learn in their traditional classroom setting, adhering to all the, the health guidelines. Uh, we know after closing school last year that that's the best form of academic instruction as much as possible. We can do live uh, interaction between the children and their teachers. We know that's most important. Um, I'm gonna move to scenario two. If we have to close down again during the year, the entire system and or a school, we have a remote learning plan, which will involve the teachers providing lessons with ordered computers uh, for all of our students. The ones that don't have them will be distributing computers for them to take home if students don't have access to the internet. We also have options to download materials. Uh, we have kits already made for K through five that students and parents can pick up weekly and return weekly for information uh, for families that may not have access to the internet. So scenario two is just for all students if the entire district is closed down. Now scenario three is in conjunction of, of going back to school. We call that our Monitor Distance and Education Program. Uh, if we have children when school opens back up and have underlying health conditions and or parents have concern, whatever those concerns are, they can sign up for the Wheaton County Monitor Distance Education Program. Uh, that's what we use in all of our credit recovery, our, our online instruction during the year. Teachers will monitor that. Uh, they will be a student in our school system. Uh, we'll grade their work and by uh, law there'll be a way that we'll, teachers will check in with them daily where they'll have to have attendance and state requires a state attendance for those children. Um, so really two and three are different. Three is a program that we'll monitor and two if we shut down will be our teachers actually providing the work for the students there. So we have a plan. Um, we know that some students will not um, be wanting to return when we come back in the fall. So there's an option for those students. Are there questions about the academic portion of that? Uh, when we return to school, you know, one of our problems, we will, we'll, if this is new for teachers, we'll be training teachers of how to do virtual instruction through go-to meetings and Zoom. Well, we have uh, that in the future. And as we've talked about, it might even be something using snow days in years, years to come. We have time will close down for bad weather, but we'll be able to communicate with our students that way. So a lot of work's gone into that plan, and I think this is something that will be much better prepared for than we were in March when this unexpectedly causes closer school down. 
On page 10, this is the application that you'll see for parents and students that want to do the, what we call the MDE, the Monitor Distance Education, when we open our schools back up. And you can see it, ask you to have that internet and have a computer um, and some other questions there. It's a one pager. Now we will, we will uh, need to specify a date. We've had conversations here. We're going to have a cutoff date to enroll for that program because we need to make arrangements of how many students are going to be involved with that, um, what technology needs to be ready for those students. So we'll, we're probably looking at about a week prior to normal school opening. We'll have a deadline for parents to register for that. We can be prepared and get them started when school actually starts. Page 11 and 12, this is just for your viewing. If we happen to close down, this is what a, a school lesson plan that teachers would provide to parents would look like. It's only if the entire school is closed down there. And so kind of has a daily plan. Uh, we'll be playing five days a week. It shows the subject area and the assignments on that. It's just an example. It's not anything that, um, that you see that, that we'll be using in the end. Any questions on academics? On the MBE program, how are we going to go about instituting that? Uh, we already know the challenges that we have in our county viable internet system, access to high speed internet. How are we going to the, the nuts and bolts of, of how that's going to work? And I think uh, Betsy here, Donald, she's on. Don't you put one of them on? I'm here. I can answer that. <laughs> okay, so if a student is enrolled in the Monitored Distance Education Program and they don't have internet access, all of those materials, materials are downloadable to a jump drive or to a laptop. And what they would do is once every week or once every two weeks, we would have to either have them come to campus or even mail back and forth those materials that they could access without the internet. So we have contingencies for that. We know we have about a quarter of our students who don't have reliable internet. Um, so we have made plans to accommodate those students if that happens. So this is a little different than last time. <laughs> we had to have access to the internet. So this program actually can be put on the computer and uh, even without internet, they can work through it. So a teacher has to, I'm sorry, John, go ahead. Okay, I'm just helping you walk through this. Okay. It's playing devil's advocate here. They don't have a computer at home. Somebody's downloading the instruction material. Are they not eligible for this program? Yeah. They are or not? They are. They are. We're going to provide the equipment. We'll provide the computer. We'll provide the computer, and we'll help work through the downloading of the materials. We have, I assume, we have. We have ordered um, two thousand computers. Okay. Now, everybody in the world has ordered computers, and so they're on back order. But we have well over a thousand currently in our, in our buildings that we can access that. Um, inventory to distribute at the beginning of the year as needed. And some of the families will have will have devices, not all of them. But we'll we have a plan we feel like we can comfortably handle that. Just out of curiosity, we have a I I know is that they get over we have a time frame from the distributor we still be here. We know we were we've ordered two different machines. One, we've ordered laptops for all of our teachers that have camera capabilities for down the road. And we were told that we might get those in August. Uh, the the student computers are going to be a little bit later because once again it's a different machine and it's something that's been ordered in mass, state and nationwide. They're saying September-ish. So really we're the we're the two thousand we're the extra student computers, what we need them is if we have to shut down all of our schools completely. Then we won't have enough to distribute. So we hope that that won't, won't happen, but if it does, it would be later in the year where at that point we have all our devices. Okay. Which leads into my next question. 
What metric? Do you have, do you have something along the line? I don't want to cut you. I just wonder who took care of this. What teacher? Are they assigned a homeroom? They won't, they won't be assigned a homeroom and how that will work. Um, the teacher will check in periodically with them, whether they be a phone call, uh, they have capabilities to Zoom, they will do that. They'll have conversations with them. They'll work out how they grade their work. And uh, what we'll do for teachers, let's say if I'm teaching fifth grade and I've got 18 in my class and five that stayed home, we're gonna pay them extra money like we do in our distance learning every year. Uh, $125 per student to do maybe after school hour work, to work with those, those students in that setting. Uh, if something were to happen, and we have more students not returned than we anticipate, then we may shuffle around our teaching staff during the day and assign a few teachers. That's all they do, would be in charge of the entire program. But we, until we actually know how many's coming back, that's hard for us to say, but there will be teachers assigned that will help monitor and create um, the work of those students. That kind of led to my next question about, do we have it, what metrics are we going to use if we decide we have to go this this learning system wide? Sarah, are we recommendations from the state, CDC? Are we are you, are you talking about when will we go to that point? What would cause us to what would cause us to shut down again? I mean, look at the positivity rates in the county. What, what is it? Uh, first of all, be a national and that would that would be the first two things that would cause us. Then it'd be locally. We just look at the positivity rate, we look in surge cases, um, and we make that determination. It possibly could even be, we might have to close the school down, but not the entire district. So that's, it's pretty fluid. Um, what that would look like, it's hard to give a definite answer here. But we, we look at some metrics and, and see what that look like. Now, you know, there's a lot of different numbers and metrics to look at if you follow the last week or two, they designated Tennessee as a red zone state. And what they based that on was for every 100,000 people in population, they were having 100 new cases per 100,000 in seven days. So what did that mean for Wheaton County? We've got 35,000 people. That means if we have 35 cases in a seven day period, new cases, we're in a, a surging area. And that's where we've been the last two weeks. That doesn't mean close down. That means you kind of need to rethink what you're doing and, and be careful as you move forward. And so um, we'll be looking at those numbers. We'll be relying on our health department and our, our medical experts to kind of guide us through that moving forward. Now, I, I want to make this clear. This modified distance education is not homeschooling. Homeschooling and, and MDE are two different things. MDE is a weekly county provided educational opportunity that takes place at home. Homeschooling a student withdraws from our school system and their parents are responsible for reporting, educating, providing the curriculum, and doing all the instructing at home. That's completely different. And that's not what we're encouraging. We're encouraging for those folks that can't come back and come back to take, take advantage of our program that we're offering until they feel like they can come back. So, good, good questions. Other academics? <laughs> I got a bunch of questions. I said somebody else <laughs> 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 Oh, I got lots of them. I feel like I'm, I'm asking. Right. Well, let's move to uh, let's move to page thirteen. Transportation. This one was is very hard. Um, you know, we have 41 buses that run our routes daily, and we normally transport over 2,000 children. The, uh, the CDC recommendations in a perfect world is for one child per seat and alternate seats between children. And that means on a 90 passenger bus, you might can haul 16 or 18 children. Um, that's not feasible for us to do. We can't make that work and get all of our kids to school. And so then we have to look at other options. What we're looking at is a couple things with our, with our transportation. We will be loading our buses from back to front. So the first children all will be assigned. They'll sit in the back. We'll assign seats. The last kids on in the morning will 
will get on, on the very front of the bus. So they'll we'll be telling them where they sit. Same thing in the afternoon. We'll have a particular way that we load the bus in the afternoon. All children will be expected to wear a mask on bus buses. We're going to try to social distance spread out as much as we can, but we know that's that's not going to be feasible. We're going to encourage parents that normally ride the bus if they are capable to transport their kids to school this year or during this time. Our drivers are very important. Our drivers that we have in our system are the beginning and the ending of our children today. We want to keep our, our drivers safe. A lot of our drivers are, are like me. They're in, getting on up there in years, and so we're going to be very careful. We're not going to set any children in the first rows behind our drivers. We're going to at least leave that much discipline our students and our drivers. Uh, our drivers will be wearing masks as children load and unload the bus. Once everyone's seated and we start moving down the road, though, they won't be required to wear their mask because it becomes a busy issue, particularly if you're wearing glasses and, and fogged up. We'll have windows down, unless it's storming, all the windows on the bus will remain down. Um, and that will be our plan. Now in Martin and Dresden, we have some high community <coughs> pickup areas, either at daycare or the community center areas. And so we'll be doing mid routes for those. Um, we've always done an after school mid route in Martin. We'll be doing that in the morning too, to, to not have so many children on those buses. Uh, Ron's working on a plan to help with some of the daycare here in, in the Dresden community. Now our, our rural areas are Gleason, Sharon and Greenfield, those buses are not as crowded as the Martin and Dresden. So some of those buses we can spread out more than we can in, in others. That, that's our, our plan. We'll be wearing masks. We'll make families sit together. Uh, we will spread them out as best we can, but realistically, we can't go in every other seat and transport 2,400 kids. Uh, we couldn't buy enough buses and hire enough drivers to make that happen. So we'll encourage parents to drive. Uh, that was my next question. And I'd like to see Mr. Clark here. I know he's one of our shining stars as the bus, the bus route driver, driver in Weaver County. What does our bus driver situation look like today? I mean, do you have some that are bowing out because of this? We, I, I, the last I talked about, we had two. And uh, one of those was a special ed driver. We have seven special ed routes. And our plan is to, because of our numbers, we think we can uh, cover that in six routes. Those buses are not crowded anyway. And then he's got some potential candidates for that other one that's holding. Unless something changed today. We had two, one of them's covered, other one for sure, and the other one pretty close to having that covered. That's an issue though. And that's going to be a concern, just like teacher staffing moving forward. If we have bus drivers that start getting sick and trying to find substitute bus drivers, those kinds of um, um, folks are not out there. So that is a problem moving forward without a great answer to what that is. The microphone is having a hard time picking up Mr. Hattler, if you would mind repeating his questions, or he needs to put on his outside voice. Okay. One, two. Okay. Great question. One question I would address Mr. Hattler asked about uh, the concerns we have about being able to staff our, our, all of our buses this year. We had some our bus drivers who were concerned about the health issues and decided not to come back. And I answered that we had two. Uh, one of those we were able to cover very easily. The other one we're working on filling has some prospects on that. Other questions on transportation? Mr. Frazier, I don't know why I'm not on the agenda, but may I ask a question? Let's, let's get through the presentation and then we need to get a motion on the table so that it's legit and then get a second and then we'll open it up to discussion among the board and then we'll open it up to the general folks in attendance. Is that okay? Does that work? Does, that, does the board have no objections with that? All right. Okay. All right. Any other questions on transportation? 14 is nutrition. And you can see we've I've pretty much already addressed that. That's the details of what our meals will look like. I will say one thing that um, concerns me moving with, with our meals. You know, last year at the board, we decided not to require students to wear their lanterns with their barcodes. And the main purpose of the barcode is for them to screen during lunchtime, not have to touch keypads and do those things. And that's gonna be very important this year. And not only that, we're looking at a program on our buses where when students come on, they can screen their barcode. 
it will be a GPS. We'll know who's on what buses, um, where our buses are located. So even if we ask students not to wear them, I'm okay with them. We need, our students need to have them on their person, typically for lunch and, and also bus riding. Um, as you can see, hot and cold meals will be available. We've got plans to be in cafeterias, various locations, and classrooms. Um, and you're still going to do the pickup, I see. If for, for parents that choose to do the, the, the distance program that are our students, they'll be able to come pick up their meals at the campus each day, just like we did for that program. Only for the ones in that program. It won't be for everyone in the community like we did in the summer. It'll be for our students um, They that are eligible, they can come get a meal, a sack lunch that will We'll have a plan for that moving forward. Any questions on the nutrition? All right, in uh, page 15 of the special populations, um, Ms. Perkins and her team spent a lot of time. As you know, we close, we communicated with all of our students weekly and our special needs children. We even did more than weekly as much as possible. We had communication with those students. We know a lot of them. Uh, had special compensatory services that were stopped because folks couldn't couldn't be out and about providing those services. So we have a plan to work forward with that when school returns. We basically, we know some of our children uh, because of underlying health issues will not be able to return, and so we'll on a case by case basis we'll be working through their IEPs and make those uh, programs available. Uh, we'll still be transporting students to buses. Um, just a normal procedure, trying to get those, those students back and, and provide all the services that, um, that we know they need in particular. And that's hard work. Um, it's hard to do meetings uh, that are required by law when you can't get folks together. And they, they battled that during the closure for March. So uh, moving forward, uh, hopefully we transition back to school, that will, will help out in that situation. If not, we'll, we'll continue to do it remotely with those children. Any questions about our special population? And then the, the last sheet that I, I have on my document, if I had it separately, is just our flyer, our colored flyer. It will be posted on the website. It talks about academics, health and safety, transportation, nutrition, as broken down into the traditional, and then the remote learning opportunities. And then at the bottom of those pages, it talks about the monitored distance education program. We'll have that available for our, our parents and host that out in the communities that we move on. So that's um, my explanation. I know it's a lot of material, a lot of questions, a lot of things different than we've never done before. Um, and we're making decisions we never thought we'd have to make, to be honest with you. And so we're open for any, any board have any other questions at this point. I would make a motion that we accept mm -hmm. the reopen the closed policy. Reopening policy got guidance. I wish that. I, let's, can we table that just a second? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I think I'd re be remiss if I didn't say this before we move forward. This is our plan for when we return to school. I'm, I'm recommending to the board tonight that we consider pushing our start date for school back later into the year. Um, for several reasons, and I've listed those, those reasons here. Um, one, as I mentioned briefly, we, we have some supplies that we need on hand before school starts. Our technology, some of our PPE, our hand sanitizing stations, we need to have all those things ready when school starts. Uh, secondly, we've had this recent two-week surge in our area. Um, our area is more impacted than it has been at any time since we closed school down. So I would recommend delaying the start of school, but that would be another reason for that. Um, our teachers need more training at the beginning of school than we've ever had before. We normally have five days planned before school, but now we're gonna not only have to teach the protocol for what school looks like when we come back, we've gotta teach our teachers how to do virtual learning in a setting where they need to be trained and need to be prepared to move forward with that. Um, 
Also, it gives us more time to plan and spread out our registration for students. That needs to look differently. We can't have all parents showing up one day in each building uh, in mass like we did in, in the past. And then another thing I think it will allow us to do, which I think is very important, is to transition, particularly our special needs children, our most needy children back to school, maybe a day or two earlier than everyone else. It gives us opportunity to kind of transition them back into a school setting without everyone being there. Um, that would be a, pos uh, a positive thing about pushing back uh, the start date. So I, I spoke to uh, Steve on a phone call, you know, I would like for us to consider, and some of you all have reached out to me individually and with your comments of, about looking at school, we can realistically push school back. Um, I'm, my recommendation would be at least for students until August the 17th. Uh, teachers would return on July 27th, and we would have three weeks of teacher training prior to any stu students returning. Now, um, some of you have even suggested maybe even moving back further than that. You can, we can do whatever we want to with the calendar. You all set the calendar. We have to meet the criteria of the number of days. I have spoken with the commissioner last week, and um, she is agreeable and told superintendents if they are postponing the start of school, that she will allow boards to request new stockpile snow days prior to the beginning of school. Clarksville Montgomery is using all 13 days and pushing their start back to the first year. Now, I personally don't want to use every day doing that because we've got a whole year to get through with weather and various things, but I think we could, um, without any problem, we could move it back and, and three weeks for teachers of in service and two weeks start date for students. How we would cover those uh, that second, third week. Principals have two days of in service during the school year. We move to the front of the calendar. We have a uh, two in service days that we use, one before Labor Day and one the first day back in January. We move those to the front of the calendar. So now that's four of the six days we would be tagging along. Um, at that point, then I would request the commissioner allow us to use six of our six more of our stockpile days. We have about half of those left. That would get us all the way up to uh, August the 17th. Now there are other options, as some of you all. Um, I spoke at length with our school board attorney in the last week or two, and we talked about things like wearing masks. And he said, from a legal standpoint, the board, I recommend you do it as much as you can and as much as you can socially distance. Another thing he shared with me is. Um, he's advising some of his districts to consider if they're revising their schedule, reconsider doing a week fall break. Because if we have, if you have a week fall break and everybody travels again, when you come back, you may be right where you're at at this point. So we're, we have as much flexibility in the calendar as you all want to have. Um, we've got an extra day before Christmas we could go. We've got six days at the end of May that we could go prior to Memorial Day. Um, we've got that fall break, we've got spring break. It's at the will of the board, but I would I would request that you all consider us at least pushing the student start date back to August the 17th, and that's fluid. Things may change between now and then, we may have to alter uh, again. Questions? This is not enough. Mark, my house out of the before, before we get into questions, I just want to take ask for a order. I think we've got. Director Frazier bring up the start date as well. I think we have two motions that need to consider. Right, we have the, the start date. That and hasn't been put in form motion. I know it hasn't, but I'm just, I'm just wondering, do we need to, we need to deal with it in two separate Yes, yes. So, and I think you can approve the plan regardless of when you start. Yes, but that's a set, I would assume that would be a separate motion. So before we do discussion of the reopening date, we need to get a motion on the table for that. Well, before we do, I have a question. All right. All right. In regard to sick days for our teachers, if one of our educators comes down and has to be quarantined, we start talking about sick days and dipping into how are we going to handle that as a board of education? Make when they are forced to be quarantined, whether or they're forced to be quarantined or even ten days. How are we going to handle that situation with our teachers? What we'll do, on, we'll meet again that first week in August, 
before if we move schools back, we still will not start school. We'll have a plan for you all to look at and approve. Currently, there's the, still the Family First Protection Act is still in effect until December 31st of this year, which means you have up to two weeks that you can provide where employees would not have to use sick days. So my, my intention would be to bring a plan to the board that covers our employees if they have to quarantine or they test positive, that they don't have to use their sick time, that we would cover that through that plan. So that definitely would, would be something I'd bring up in August of the 7th. Thank you. Okay. Well, they won't because we may hire a new teacher doesn't have any sick days, and if we ask them to quarantine, then they're looking at days without pay. So we would work around that. Do we have any teachers that are not coming back that we know of? I mean, I'm not asking for names, but just we have a rough number. We had, uh, I think, a couple that retired, and we've had two or three or four that said they're con considering looking what the plan looks like. But that's another reason for pushing back. If we push back the plans out there and we have staff that decide not to come back, it gives us a little leeway to try to find people to fill positions we offer. So that At this time, we have two motions to consider in this part of the agenda. So the chair will recognize a motion to recommend a, de a delay in the start of school to August the 17th, 2020. That's our motion. We want to do the reopening plan first, and we want to do. I, so I'm not. I'll tell you, I'm not ready to vote on the date. I need. I need 10, 15 minutes. Okay, that's fine. Chair will, will entertain a motion of either one. So <laughs> I thought I was making that motion. You were going ahead and making that motion, so we'll recognize that motion. Is there a second? Yeah. All right. So we are on the recommendation of the reopening plan. And what I'd like to do, if that's okay with the board. Uh, if there's any other discussion among the board, and then we can bring it up to some of the questions that maybe those in attendance might have on the plan itself. Not, we're not talking about the reopening date, we're talking about the reopening plan. So at this time, is there any discussion among board members or questions relating to the reopening plan? Any other discussion? I do have one question. Um, I think the gentleman who left was asking about available documentation. I just want to double check that this will be made available on our website. Okay. Any other documentation? Uh, we can, we'll post the reopening guidelines on there too, not just the one sheet of the reopening. We can make that assessment. Okay, I'd like to pull this, this too. Okay. Any other questions? All right, and, uh, related to communication, I and mean, we'll put out a press release related to this. Karen and I had a separate plan. We didn't bombard you all with we'll, we'll take care of the communication. Okay. Um, matter of fact, I'm going to do a webcast tomorrow. Okay. I'll go ahead the radio station using the new call. We'll, we've got a plan to quickly have information for our folks. Okay. Uh, any other discussion or questions among the board? I do think that there was a question. Sir, do you have a question related to uh, transportation, sir? Okay, go ahead if you have a question. Uh, you said you would, uh, we're going to have a meeting tomorrow. We're going to, I'd like to say this about Ron Biden. He's the best boss we can have. But you're saying, brain, as I load my children on my bus, I put to the back to the front. Yes. Okay. What happened to my first child on? Second, third child along, which it is on my bus, kindergarten, and third, or fourth grade. I am very fortunate to have a bus that has six cameras on it. I've got one of your buses. But what I'm getting at is I have a kindergarten on the back seat of that bus. I cannot even see their heads because of the safety of the buses. Okay. My problem or my way I look at it is the safety of my children. I don't want, personally, this is my personal, I do not want a kindergarten sitting on the back seat for three or four high school students. I don't want a third or fourth grader back there. If you understand what I'm saying, sir. That is, I've talked to Ron about this. Ron has brought this up to me. 
In the afternoon, we load our buses. Just a little bit back this up. We load our buses as kindergartners, uh, elementary, and then middle school. Well, they're all over, they're all going to the back. Then my high school comes up to get on my bus. They're all on the front. But I have six, seventh, and eighth graders back over kindergarten children. My concern is, and the rules are, the law is, that if I have a kindergarten child, child any of us bus drivers, to let that child off at home and we see no activity, we've got to keep them on that bus. Right. That's the law. But at the same time, we're putting them in the back of the bus and you have them go to sleep, which I have to brag on myself. I check my bus. I am very fortunate I have the last child button on my bus. And I check all my seats and everything I get. But that is my concern for each one of you board members. It's the safety of my younger children versus the older children. That's what that's what my concern is. Even if I have a kindergarten sitting on my right side and you said sign seats, I do sign seats. I'm gonna tell you how I run my bus. I have the boys on one side and the girls on the other because they were a problem on that bus that I took over before I take it in. I had to <coughs> came to drive. Okay. Rule no 14 is says we sign seats. I'm signing the boys to one side and the girls to the other. Okay. So my really my main concern to all of y'all is the safety of my children. As I enroll them children, I want my kindergarten and my younger students to be well taken care of, but I cannot see them if I've got high school on the front and kindergarten on the back. But I'm fortunate, again, I'm fortunate. My cameras on my bus will pick up at least, the it even tells how fast I'm driving, what road I'm on. Those cameras have a GPS. Well, I think Mr. Plum, I'm talking with Ron too. He's looking at changing some of the normal routes. So what your normal route looks like might be different. But that's something for sure we can discuss with him um, about you know your way in normal safety against COVID-19 safety. So we right. kind of we need to find a big that's well right. taken. We'll we'll address that. But Mr. Fraser or school board, I'm that's the school. I have students that I may see to Monday, and I may not see them again to Friday. And I've told Ron this many times, and he's asked me, did I want to change routes for this one reason? I don't know who's going to ride. Well, now here, here's one thing I will say that will be different this year. Glad you brought it up. In the past, our, our busing service has become an Uber, where for example, if parents want to have kids sleep over or mom decides she's going shopping today, she wants Susie to go to a friend's house, we're not going to be able to do that this year. We're going to give parents two options for us to drop off. We're going to have to adhere to that because of the difference in the times. We can't be waiting on people to show up at the house. Like you have to hold kids uh, sometimes when parents are not there. So we, we won't be having as much of uh, changing routes and kids that we don't expect riding buses and those kinds of things. We're gonna have a stricter schedule so they can do it this time. But I'll say, kind of just say one more thing. Now in the morning, I could do this seat space usually because I got a 78 pack of bus. I may not have the 40, 45 feet or something. I can space them out. But that then I may have seats to 65. It's just different. And I'll just say you need to talk to Ron and work with the school cool. principal because it's different in each town. And what those concerns, we'll try to figure out the best well, I, resolution. You know, I just wanted to ask that question. But I, I know the buyer. Uh, now, see, that's something we didn't think about. I, I, well, I wouldn't think about that. I'm glad. <coughs> we, uh, I think I was wondering yesterday, but I wish the school board really Ron would wants to reconsider the okay. doing that. Go from the back. Okay. Because I, won't, I already know. Hang on, Ron. Know, all my students passed. From eighth grade, I'm gonna have about 
almost a half a dozen over half high school kids. Going on to be freshmen. You understand what I'm saying? Good afternoon. Can y'all hear me okay? This is, this is Ron. Well, yes. Hey, uh, Ronald, <clears throat> your uh, your in service meeting will be. Can you guys hear me okay? You're, you're doing fine. I, I'll translate for you, Ron. He, <laughs> okay, sir. He said his in service yes. meeting was tomorrow, so I think you can cover that tomorrow. Is that what you're about to say? Yeah. One of the things I think I think uh, there's there's a little bit of uh, misunderstanding there. On the afternoon route, when we load the kids, they're going to be loaded based on their drop-off location. The student that's in the front seat should be the first one we drop off. And uh, Mr. Plunk, on your route and, and a lot of the others, um, I know you're going to have more riders in the afternoon than you do in the morning. And that's something, you know, when we had our, our in-service today with the Martin drivers, I had three or four drivers sitting there they were already planning in their head where those students are going to sit. So <clears throat> you just, you, you guys know how to set up your route. You know where your children are going to go. You may get two or three new students this year, but for the most part, you're going to have the same students you had last year. So you're going to have to, uh, we're going to social distance as best we can on the buses. That means if we can, when we can skip seats, we're going to, or we'll stagger seating. And uh, Mr. Plunk, you're going to build your afternoon route. Uh, it's going to be reversed to your morning route. So when they get on in the morning, you're going to load from the back to the front. When you load in the afternoon, those same kids should be in those same areas because you're going to run that route just opposite of what you did that morning. And uh, tomorrow I'll explain that to you a little bit better in class. But the reason why we do this uh, <clears throat> is so that we can – we can prevent these students from uh, interacting too much on the bus. If you pick up your first student, all right, and you put them on the front seat, every child you load after that is gonna come in contact with that first student. They're gonna have to pass by them as they get on the bus, vice versa in the afternoon. So what we're trying to do is limit contact on the bus. So that's, that's our reasoning behind doing all that. Thank you, Ron. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Plunk. Is there other question? In this plan that you guys have set forth, I didn't hear information about the after school daycare program like it does, and I I depend on that. It's not only because of my my work schedule is not a set schedule. I have to work when they need me, but it's also my grandson's tutoring math homework, and he so desperately needs that extra help. And thank God for that program because my grandson passed first grade with straight A's in math, which I never thought would ever happen. And I thank God for that program. And I would hate to lose that program this year because it's so beneficial, not for me, but for a lot of parents and a lot of grandkids and a lot of children that need that help. And especially if both parents work till 530. And we, we had, and I was going to bring this up to the board after we talked about the start dates and all. We've had conversations with the two Martin principals in Dresden. There, there are obviously a lot of pros for after school. We've got some concerns this year because of having to do the social distancing. And now we're intermingling a lot of kids from different grades. Right. Our biggest concern, though, is staffing, uh, particularly in our, in our Martin before and after school program. The majority of those part-time workers are college students, and we're not sure how many of those are coming back. So that's been our concern about the before and after school program is being able to staff. Now, I heard in a conference Friday with some other superintendents, um, most districts are continuing to have the program, but they're limiting how many can come. They're not, like normally, we might have 70 at the primary, in North primary. We don't have the staff to handle that in social distance. And so they're having to determine who comes and who doesn't. And that's another issue. How do you determine who really needs to come and who's just taking advantage of that? So I would say before we open that, that's something we may need to have more conversations about, it, particularly with the university and see what they're going to do as far as students coming back. Have you thought about letting, like, I used to be the playground supervisor from the old elementary school was at the old building. And we had the after school daycare program there. I was the playground supervisor over that program. If there's anything that I can do as far as helping with that program, 
I'm all for it. And we may look to do that. You know, we said earlier, volunteers, we're going to be needing volunteers throughout the year. Appreciate your comment. We know that's an important service, and, and that's something we'll need to keep looking at moving forward. We had every intention of having that program for all this happening. Yeah. We were scrambling for, for folks, and we'll, we'll let you know in plenty of time. Thank you. I run dressing at the school program, and I can accommodate at least 50 kids already. I have five workers. I would assign my five worker each one a set of 10, and we can social distance because we have the old school. We can separate them out. We already have plans, and we. I think, I think Dresden is. Not our issue. I think Mark, because we have so many children, and that staff comes from the university. So I appreciate you saying that you feel comfortable there. We may just need to work on the market. Okay. Well, if I can help in any way, I've, okay. I've already went to Martin before and got him back on track and know about that. So if I can do anything, I would even volunteer to help out at Martin if need be. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, the question I do have is you guys are talking about wearing gloves because run gloves and face masks, right? Only gloves if they're cleaning something. If they happen to be cleaning off like maybe their desk or something, they would put them on, clean it, and throw the glove away. Okay, so you're not talking about if they're wearing gloves no, all day long. No, that's only if they're cleaning. If they have to clean something with a wipe, they would wear it, it wouldn't hurt their hand. Okay, now are you talking about masks like this or are you talking about the shields for all the kids? I'm talking about just the general masks. Face cover, not a shield for every kid. Okay, now what if we have children that cannot wear the mask because of asthma or because they have sensory problems? If we have students or staff that are, can't wear them because of asthma or underlying conditions, then they won't be required to wear them. Okay. Any other questions? Discussion? Any more discussion among the board members on this? Uh, motion, I will reiterate, the motion is to recommend the reopening plan as laid out by Director Frazier. Any questions, concerns, discussion? All right, we'll move to the vote. All those in favor of approving the Wheaton County School reopening plan for 2020, say aye. Uh, All opposed, aye. say nay. And the motion carries. Martin, Steve, or eyes, Patricia. At this time, we will consider the recommending of a delay in the start of school. Uh, Director Frazier mentioned the date of August the 17th, 2020. So I'm going to, the floor will open up for a motion on the date of opening. We'll move on the date of August the 17th. Okay, is there a second? Motion and a second. Questions? Question. <laughs> <laughs> Who, how are we going to accommodate our teachers and children that uh, we back this up to the 17th? We have teachers that have children. Daycare is not, I mean, not available. We've got daycare centers all over Wheaton County that are back open or on to open on limited capacity. What are we going to do? Now that, that's a big deal. Yes, we've got a plan if we shut down completely, we're going to let them bring their kids to school. Okay, and that's kind of hard to do in your training. Um, Okay. You know, we talked about last year, and we did. We moved forward. We even considered, and we didn't bring it to the board because it got got squelched when we started working the state. We were looking at maybe providing a daycare in our schools for our staff regularly, not just in emergency. But there's so many guidelines and stipulations you have to follow when you do that. There's no way we could ever get that approved. Now, I'm open. It, you know, if we want to look at some ways where at the school level for us maybe to have some way for 
us to watch those children. We probably wouldn't even know how many kids we're talking about. Um, that is, that, that'll be an issue there. No doubt about that. Do we know what kind of time frame and how many days it's going to take to get our educators up to speed on the training for Google Classroom and all of this? I, I, I mean, I'll tell you, you, our conversation, full disclosure, I, I was a big proponent three weeks ago of starting after Labor Day. I was. I've had a change of heart in the last week for a lot of reasons. I don't know where I, I really don't know where I feel about pushing it back two weeks. Um, but I, I do, well, I mean, the, the, you know, and I care the training, the training component, I, I would like to know how long we think that training is going to take to get that in because that we've got a lot of parents out there too that whether they don't want their kids with them anymore or or, or the, the health and well-being of our teachers, the health and well-being of the children. I mean, they, like I said in the last meeting, these kids have been slobbering all over each other since the spring and they're seeing each other anyway. So my my I, I know we have it's a delicate balance. So I would kind of like to have an idea it's going to take two weeks to train our two weeks to train our teacher. I, I think it's going to take a full two weeks. Now we've already begun some of that process. Mr. Maddox has been working scheduling teachers to do that. That's going to be an ongoing. I would think the first week will be normalcy, the things we normally train on, and talk about what the logistics of COVID looks like. How are we going to change operations and protocol? To me, that's going to be the first week of teacher training. Second week will be more focused on instruction. What does instruction look like now virtually uh, with our MDE program and train our teachers there? In my mind, the third week now gives us some time to spread out our registration, to maybe transition our CDC kids back a day earlier. Uh, not as much training that week as it is us trying to get school started back. Even some conversations we've had that uh, we might even be open to not bringing all the kids back like maybe the Friday before we start, at Westview they might have their juniors and seniors come in the morning. Just kind of like a check-in, get their schedule, kind of walk through some stuff, and the older ones and after. That's just an example, not set in stone. But I would say two weeks for training, and that third week is kind of spread things out, gives parents a chance to decide which route they're taking. Now, once here, here's one thing that we've got in our program. If, if a parent decides not to come back and they want to do the weekly county uh, distance learning program, then they're gonna to have to commit to that program for a semester. We don't want kids going back and forth. Now, because logistically you can't do that staffing wise and figure out how that works. The next thing we're going to think about is what do we do for extracurricular activities? I can tell you a couple of school systems said, if you choose home, you don't do extracurricular stuff at school, you don't play sports first semester, and we'll need to decide that, in my opinion, at the August board meeting if we push start a school day back. So um, did I answer your question? Two weeks of training, one week to kind of give us a, a cushion. And then once again, it gives us an extra wiggle room to get our stuff in, our shields and supplies. And when would the uh, registration and stuff in this plan? It would be, it would have to be fluid. It would look different. For example, Sharon can do it in one day. Some of the other schools are looking at multiple days where they don't, and that, that would be, each school would advertise that. We'd help promote that. It would look different for the building. Right. What are other systems around us doing? What's their plans? Are well, I have talked, and since Friday, I've talked to six different systems that are now considering pushing their date back. Madison County already has. I've had one system that takes me 15 minutes to let me know as soon as y'all make a decision. I'm sure <laughs> 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 I talked to a teacher from a neighboring county one day last week. She ran into and they said they were going as planned. Now, that can be changed this Friday as well. I just kind of wondered if you spoken with anyone. And uh, Well, there's there's even some rumblings out there that the governor may trump everybody this week. But we have to make some decisions ourselves. So, you know, I hate to see us. I hate to see us wait. I really do. But if you think we need to wait, then, and I don't see how y'all will be ready, even with that. That's um, yeah, that's what I'm told, but I'm sure they may see us postpone. I really do. I understand and believe in. 
I also yeah. have a question as I do just uh, in talking with teachers, parents, students um, at Greenfield, Greenfield School, they're ready to go back to school as planned. Um, just a total concern. Kids are not, uh, kids are not social distancing anyway uh, at this point. Uh, this may actually help that a little bit if they're at school, they're social distancing in school. Um, but like I said, the teachers are ready to go back. Uh, they voice that opinion to me, at least those who have come to me. I've had very little that has said uh, in a positive way we should wait or we shouldn't go back. Um, so the feedback that I've gotten is, is they're ready to go back as planned, as scheduled. I briefly hit on this, but this monster <laughs> fall break that we created. Uh, what, what does this do to the fall break? Because it's Katie bar the door. Like you said earlier, we, we still have a fall break. We still want to have it. We back this up two weeks, three weeks. Or we still want to have a fall break. <clears throat> that, if you all decide for a start August 3rd, that's what we're going to do. If you all push it back, my recommendation for us to pick a day, and then on August 7th, we can make the logistics of the rest of the calendar work. I can come back and say, the, the commissioner's going to approve us to use five more stockpile days. Or we could not even ask those and say, this is something I call And that could take care of that a little bit. And I spoke with uh, the president of the WCEA on a couple of occasions, and she realizes that we're open, and it's the board's decision we had to alter the calendar. And she said, we kind of were expecting some of that potentially. Um, so, it's ultimately the calendar is you all's decision, even though we involve teaching in them. But when it comes to it, some districts only let teachers have input in the calendar. We do start August 3rd. Let's say that we do. Are we prepared? I, mean, I understand Mr. Floyd's position with his constituents. Mine's situation is a lot different. I mean, I have Dresden and Martin, people that are in my district. I know you're tired of saying the word fluid. I am too. That's fluids. Are, glass of water. Now it's a situation. So are we prepared if there is an outbreak in Greenfield, for instance? I know we talked about shutting Greenfield down completely. Is there a K-12 building? And it's still continuing on if, if Martin or Dresden or Gleason or Sharon are not a hot spot and Greenfield turns into one. You know, we we prepared for logistically for that. Yeah we can make that work. Of course sir. The recommendation is, even from the health department, is to take every measure once we open and try not to have to shut the schools completely down. That's, that's the issue. If we can get open, we don't want to have to shut down again if there's any way possible, but we don't know. You know what's going on. The concerns about being ready, we won't, we won't have distance learning training in place. So if something happens in September, we have to shut down and go to remote. We won't be ready. I can tell you that. The some of the the PPE stuff like the hand sanitizers, we can come up with a bunch of squirt bottles rather than the touchless. And we could probably make that work. To me, it's the instructional part of what if the governor comes back and says September one, we need to shut down. We won't be ready for that. We're going to be like we were in March, having to figure out optional stuff. And now, by law, we have to have a plan that's gradable. It has to be approved by the state department. So that's the that's the big issue and checking attendance when they're at home and all those kinds of things it doesn't make sense we've got to figure out a way to do that all right you know i'm a sports guy this is reclassification year when's that day the tsla had an executive briefing that the board control did today you <coughs> see their meeting about classification and sports so i don't know what there's a lot of speculation about football and soccer what that's going to look like. We hope to hear something Wednesday. We're at the mercy of whatever they decide at the state level. Josh, Mr. Vandry has a comment. Okay. Well, I can't afford to do it. You're in charge. I just wanted you to know you want to Comment on Jeff's comment that I have not had that experience at all. All of the calls I've taken in the past week have been for teachers and parents very concerned about coming back. I said, Two teachers say they're seriously considering quitting over it. So, you know, it is totally different, Martin versus, you know, versus Greenville. 
that I haven't had that experience, unfortunately. I said at the beginning, our decision is wrong. Right. We're not going to exactly. make that one now. Steve, you're recognized. And he disappeared out of it. Oh, here he comes. I'm here. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, folks. Thanks for covering this. Um, I've had similar comments with uh, people that I'm uh, in my district and friends and colleagues about they're ready to go back to school. I cannot, in good faith, vote to go back to school if we do not have the health and safety precautions in place when our children walk and teachers walk in those schools. So as much as I'm ready to get back to school and everybody else is, if we can't protect the health and safety with hand sanitizers and, and those things that we know we need to start with any plan whatsoever, I think that is as much as an important part of this decision as anything. Thank you. I would just say, you know, who would ever dream we in, in our planning, for example, planning to eat in the classrooms, if we have to do that, our plan is we, we, we eat in the classrooms, teachers will put the garbage in a can, we set the garbage outside the classroom door, our custodians will come by with a large garbage can or rollers, dump all the garbage, haul it off for us. So that's different than we've ever done. So we need to order extra garbage cans. We need 60 for our 10 schools. 60 55 gallon can on rollers to cover all the garbage. They told us we might get them by the end of August, 1st September. I never dreamed you couldn't get a garbage can. That's what we're running into with normal stuff that we just can't get for some reason. You mentioned the lunchroom petitions too. They're, they're not installed. They're not. I've got, got an ag person working on some right now, one school, and we've got a, a vendor, a local vendor that's looking at doing some of those too. Were we considering like opening what, at any time during the preparations, maybe in May, early June, of going back without any kind of guidance? So I, we have always been going in this direction. We did at one point at the first of June we had zero active <coughs> but is it is it is what's it, changed is a, a month ago when our cases were low I said we're going to be in good shape we had everything ordered we didn't dream that stuff wasn't going to come in because stuff had started picking back up delivery but the surge has caused things that we thought could we it's been filtered to some other area whether it be health departments or Cold nursing paper. homes or toilet paper. Don't look over that. <laughs> and so that's that's one that my cleaning company said the only thing that they're struggling, they can't get any hand soap. And they serve country nationwide. They're having trouble getting the hand soap to put in the dispensers. And I said, don't worry, we got plenty of hand sanitizer coming. Well, we <laughs> now we've got that on back order. Have you been peppered by other vendors reaching out to you? Oh. Thousands. <laughs> Thousands. It's smart. Everybody's got some upset. Any other board member have anything to discuss? Questions, comments? Anybody in attendance have any questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. I have to agree with you. Our kids are playing every day together. They're out playing basketball, they're going to soccer, playing soccer together. Um, we've already lost so much because of this for our kids this year. And a lot of the kids are either not playing with each other because we're not close to each other. Like we're a couple miles apart. She has work. I'm a stay-at-home mom, but so our schedules not work. There's family member, you know, parents that I don't know personally, but my kid, my kid does, and he's like, "When can I go back to school? When I can I go and play with my my friends? I miss my friends." Not only that, but I also have a child, and there's other children too that have disabilities that are you know, regressing because of this. And now, you know, we're gonna go and push it to August 17th 
that's even pushing that further back there or that could regress move it. If we don't start soon, and who's to say that, okay, we start August 17th, that we won't be shut down in two months because all of a sudden there's more people coming up positive. You know, how many people actually do not get hot, you know, tested that we don't know? We're in the grocery store, okay, masks and everything else. That's fine. I understand some concerns, but I also, you know, look at it as otherwise. You never know when you're going to go and get this, if you even are. I appreciate that. I do. I'll, I'll just say this. The biggest thing, I think, for a lot of us up here is the children. I, I have two children in school, and, I, and I'm kind of like you. They have missed the week. They just have it. My biggest fear is it, it, the teachers. Yes. It just straight, it's, and when it's like anything else, you throw the pebble in the pond. Our substitute situation is not optimal right now. Right. We just, there's a lot of, like Mr. Frazier has said, we've all said there's not a right answer here. Right. I, I just hope that most people stay off emotional media, understand that, that we, we struggle with this. Uh, I do appreciate, I appreciate you coming, but I, I'll just say the big thing that, that I would encourage you to, to for everyone to think about is 30% of our our faculty and staff are over the age of 50. Yes. And just that for me, that's a scary part. Oh, it is. Yeah, that's a scary part. <laughs> and I agree with you 100%. I, I, I watched the other children with autism for years. And the routine is, is so important. Oh, yes. And it's, it's, it's a huge deal, but it's, I, I just want to tell you, I, I appreciate you coming. I shared with our, our administrative team the other day in our last full-fledged meeting before tonight's meeting that we know the focus has been on academics lost. That's not going to be our focus when we return back to school. It's going to be social, emotional, health, and those kinds of things. And we'll figure out the schoolwork after that because that's a big issue. Union City's director uh, said in a conference Friday they started their one-week academic camp last week they normally have for their special needs kids and their at-risk students and he said all we dealt with was discipline problems all week because kids have been home they're out of structure there so we know that's coming too and we all want to be back at school the kids miss their teachers teachers miss their kids we, we just want to do it safely and do it in the right way any other comments uh, Gary? Appreciate all your work that you've done, Mr. Frazier. And I'd like to say something to John you, when we're talking about the, the school system having a daycare for the workers there. And want another tool in our toolbox for Wheaton County that we could get better teachers. And we, we find that working on the pay that many of you talked about for the last couple of years. But if we could continue as the board, it's probably not to talk about this. But if we could get a daycare for our teachers and how many young teachers that we got are having babies, they can come back to school faster and teach the children while their kids is at daycare. And there's other school systems that's connecting us that has it and it works great. And a lot of other teachers go to those school systems knowing that. So I'd like to encourage y'all, and I know John's talked about it, to think about that in the future once this kind of passes by. And I know it's a doable thing for the other systems around the building. Any other comments from the board and those in attendance? All right, the motion that you have before you is the recommendation, which has been seconded, to delay the start of school to August the 7th, 2020. When we go forward with this vote, an I vote or a yay vote will be in favor of the delay. A nay vote would be a rejection of that recommendation. Okay. Does everybody understand? All right, good deal. Make sure. All right, all those in favor of this motion say aye. Uh, aye. All opposed say nay. Nay. Two eyes over here. Two eyes over here. Let's do a roll call if you don't mind. I heard some nays. Okay, go ahead. Uh, 
Bo Atkins. Aye. Jim Floyd. Aye. Martin Hamlin. Aye. John Hattler. Aye. Uh, Gad Mays. Aye. Joshua Moore. Aye. Doug Sims. Aye. Steve Ventries. Aye. 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 Two no. Okay. Seven yes, two no. So the motion is carried. <laughs> that is the conclusion of that motion. All right, we'll move on to committee reports. There are none on the agenda. Any committees wish to report at this time? Seeing none, we'll move on to consent items. You see that is agenda item number eight, uh, number nine, for the hiring of non-faculty coaches. Is there a motion to accept and approve these consent items? Second. Second. All right, motion and seconded. Any questions related to the consent items? Seeing none, all those in favor of the consent items say aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed say nay. And the consent items are approved. This time, Director Frazier, I know you've spoken already quite a bit, but do you have any other reports to make? No, I'll just say we meet August 7th. I'll have some options, calendar options, August the 6th. Of how we would do that, I'll, I'll request the commissioner consider stockpile days, and also have a proposal maybe we might have a fall break, and, and we'll get that all we'll decided. Does any board member have anything wish to add to the meeting? Mr. Chairman, there has been a question about attendance and truancy that have been voiced in a couple of two or three citizens here on the on the chat. Uh, I would say as a tenant supervisor that the law concerning truancy gives us no leeway. It is still five unexcused absences. However, there will be new definitions coming for all weekly county students that will be shared on day one. And we have stated that a student who is missing school due to COVID symptoms or quarantine, if he's able to meet all the other requirements will be considered present, but we will, uh, be publishing definitions as we get closer to day one. We, we know that we're going to have more absences for students. Uh, uh, any other, any, any board member wish to add anything else at this time? Any objections for adjournment? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you. What the Facebook is yeah. That's where that question came from. Hey, thank you guys. I appreciate it. Good job and uh, good luck with everything. Thank you all. Thanks, guys. Thank you all. No, I know. I heard it. You know, like they heard it three times. No, that's not a problem.